Welcome, Lisa, to Success with Soul. I'm so glad you're here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. We were just chatting before I hit record about all of this, like small world ways that we actually were connected. And it's just interesting to see, like, even in this day and age where we're not even leaving our homes and everything, there's still like all of these cool connections that are happening in the background. So I love that. Yeah. We're always connected much more than we think we are. Yes. I love that. So Tell us, Lisa, I know you're a leadership coach. You really focus on helping people expand their capacity to handle more growth, wealth, and success. So this is so important. I can't wait to dive deep into what this means. But before we get there, tell us how did you become such an expert in this arena and expand your own capacity for growth and success? Yeah. Um, Well, the way I came to this is just through experience. I've been doing this for 11 years. And when I started my business, I started health coaching because I was really interested in nutrition and detoxification at the time. And I noticed that after a few sessions, all of my clients, which tended to be like very busy professional women or women with their own businesses, I had a couple of men too, and they just weren't talking to me about their nutrition anymore. After a couple of sessions, we were talking about deeper issues that they were struggling with, which were just informing the food choices they were making. And so, you know, when you do something enough time, you start to notice patterns. And I started to realize that, okay, health coaching is not what I should be doing. I'm obviously like excelling coaching people on something deeper, but I didn't have the word capacity for it yet. So I I always tell people like, don't fret about finding your exact purpose because it really, if you just move forward, it reveals itself to you. And that's exactly how capacity came to me. So um, personally, in 2015, I, it was the end of 2014 and my business had just exploded and I had literally wait lists for my wait lists. There were so many people that were trying to work with me and I was really, I didn't realize it until I got to the end of the year, but I was really burned out. And because I was burned out, I wasn't thinking clearly. And I decided to make an investment in setting up a funnel for a $97 product. Now I had never had a $97 product in my business. I had always had, you know, like higher ticket sort of offerings. It's just my vibe. It's just what works for me. Mm -hmm. And I put a hundred thousand dollars into this funnel and it tanked. Mm -hmm. So I end 2015 with a hundred thousand dollars in debt in my business. That hurts. It was so scary at the time because I'd never had that much debt in my business. I was about five years in at that point and I'd been pretty successful. I mean, I really hustled in the first year and managed to hit six figures in my first year of business. And um, so anyway, I, I just was like depressed at the end of 2015. Like I failed, like, I don't know how this happened. Like, why didn't this work? And I remember having a conversation with my father, who's the only other business person in my family. Everybody else is a doctor. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, oh my God, it just feels like the end of the world. And he's like, Lisa, I've had like 500,000 in debt. He's like, all businesses carry debt. Like you'll, you'll pay it off. Don't worry about it. And I was like, oh, it totally changed my perspective. And so As I started, you know, once he, I felt better after talking to him, I started reflecting on my year and like, what led to these choices and why didn't this strategy work for me, even though it had worked so well for so many other people. And I started, and then at the same time, a client said to me, her words to me were, I have expanded my capacity so much working with you. And I'm just like a stepping into a whole new way of being in the world. When she said that to me, it just hit this light bulb. And I went, that's what I do. And that's what I've been doing all of these years is helping people have more capacity for these. Because everybody I work with is ambitious and wants to achieve great things more than the average person around them. And I'm not saying average is bad. Mm -hmm. Most of the people I work with are just, they just want to like go beyond, you know? And um, so I started I started to realize that. And when she said that to me, a lot of times, you know, our clients reflect things back to us about ourselves. And I went, that's why this didn't work for me because I actually was experiencing a capacity issue in 2014 where I had so much demand 
and I didn't have, it, it wasn't really that I didn't have the right business model. It's that I didn't have all the different, now I've discovered like there's six different capacities most people tend to struggle with. I had issues with all six of those. And what happens is when we get to these places of burnout and overwhelm because we don't have the capacity, we start thinking it's a strategic problem, it's a business model problem, I need to use these crystals, I need to say these mantras, and we're not actually dealing with the deeper issue, which, which is, I built this whole thing, and I forgot, because it's what we all do, nobody in the business world or the success world talks about the capacity to mm -hmm. hold, handle, and receive what you want. We talk a lot about the, the perfect strategies, the step-by-step. -step. Maybe there's some like touching upon mindset stuff, but all that's surface level. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I started realizing, oh, I didn't need to change my business model in 2015 and like do this whole $97 project, which was really not aligned with my vibe or my energy. I needed to tap in and, and actually expand my capacity and fix the capacity issues I was having because then when I applied a strategy, it would have actually worked because it would have been the right strategy for me. So that's how I came to this work. Fascinating. So there's two things I want to touch on there. And the first is what you said in the beginning, which is don't fret on kind of finding your expertise or your niche and I was just talking to a friend about this this past week of how it holds so many people back from taking action because they think they have to have it all figured out, like the perfect messaging, the perfect niche, the perfect, like all of this clarity. It's like, you're never going to get that until you just start doing it. And then yeah. that's when you start realizing, oh, this is what I enjoy. This is what I'm good at. And then, like you said, clients start reflecting back to you. This yeah. is what you're teaching me. And it may not be the thing that you set out to do. Exactly. A hundred percent. Like if you just stay aware, it's kind of like if, if I were to tell, if you were to ask me like, Hey, where's that barn I'm looking for down the road. And I'm like, if you take 15 steps, you'll see on the right hand side, a cherry tree. And if you turn right at the cherry tree, then you'll see the farm. But if you're standing there and you won't take the 15 steps, and you're like, I can't see the cherry tree from here. Well, you can't see it. I'm <laughs> taking the 15 steps. And that's what we do. We're like, but I have to have it all figured out before I start. And God, no, like I have had, my brand has shifted like 80 times probably mm -hmm. in the last 11 years. And you just become more and more of you. And the more people you work with, you're more aware of what your skills are. And actually that's why one of the six capacities I talk about is purpose capacity, because mm -hmm. We have to have the capacity to allow that journey to happen instead of like constantly stopping it because we think we have to like have the perfect clarity about it immediately. Right. That's literally never, ever happened for me. I have never been a hundred percent clear about, you know, my purpose or I'm always, there's always some unknowns and there's always some things where I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen. Let's try Let's it. Let's see. Yeah. 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 I'm so glad you said that. Cause I do think, especially anybody listening, who's in the earlier stages of their business, like it does, it holds us back so much. And we, we end up doing like busy work so that we feel like we're working, but we're really just hiding. And yeah. I just like everybody, you know, and in, in the six figure blog Academy, one of my courses, we teach people how to grow and monetize their blog. And so many people take months just to launch because they're tinkering with all of the things on the back end. I'm like, just effing do it. Let's go. And then you'll figure it out. And, you know, you go back and you look at any successful blogger and their first posts. It's terrible. Every time nobody hits it out of the park on the first one, you just keep yeah. going and you learn from there. And I mean, it applies obviously to all all industries, but I'm glad, I'm glad we were able to talk about that. Cause I feel like it's, yeah, it's so important. Now tell us a little bit more about what does capacity really mean? Yeah. So what the way I define capacity in my work is that it's your ability to hold handle and receive every next level of your growth. And the reason I define it that way is, you know, there's a metaphor that I love using for this is Think about all the people that have like hit a huge jackpot in the, in the lottery. Like they won $250 million. And then a lot of people you hear like five years later, they're broke. And you're mm -hmm. like, what the heck did you like lose $250 million? Like I could have had that. I would have been, everybody, you know, um, one of my, my mentors, uh, Lena West, she says, everybody's a genius until the test comes. Mm. <laughs> 
So, so um, true. Yeah. And so, you know, the reason they lo- like the reason that that happens is because they had a financial set point. So let's say they were used to making 50,000 and that's the capacity they had. They had the capacity to make 50,000. But if they suddenly get 250 million, they've got to expand their capacity to understand who they are, how they spend, how they show up, how they manage their money, what their life is like at $250 million. And they didn't do that. And so what happens is they spend down to get back to their capacity set point. It works the same way in every area of our lives or our our work and our businesses. For example, if you're used to having subpar team members, for example, and that's all you think you deserve because you've got embodiment capacity issues and structural capacity issues, um, then you're just going to keep hiring people who are subpar, who are like not doing a great job, but that's all you think you deserve. You haven't expanded your capacity to call in an A player onto your team. Mm. And so a lot of times I have women who are very successful and they're like, why do I keep getting these really bad team members that like don't (laughs) do their jobs and have to be micromanaged? And I'm like, well, let's look at you. What part of you doesn't think you deserve to have this level of support? What part of you is just so used to having to micromanage that it's like become ingrained into your nervous system. And so then when you show up to interview people, you, first of all, the type of job description you post has that energy in it. So it attracts the wrong candidates to begin with. And then when you show up to the interview, if you happen to have an A player on the interview, your level of capacity causes you to completely overlook that person and pick the person that is the mediocre that you're used to having on your team. And so, yeah, I mean, it's a huge issue. I can so relate to that. That hits home very much. (laughs) I relate to it too. I mean, everything I teach, I've learned. Right. (laughs) So, so yeah, I mean, that's why capacity is so important because, you know, if you want to make, you're talking about six figure blog, right? Like if you want a six figure blog, well, who is the version of you that has a six figure blog? Cause it's not the version of you that doesn't, Mm. right? Yeah. There's upgrades that have to happen on, in several areas of your capacity in order for you to literally be able to handle it, receive it, and manage it well. Because a lot of people, a fear I hear constantly is, well, I want to make a million dollars or I want to do this, but what if I can't handle it? There's, mm-hmm. And if you've got, what if I can't handle it? Like, what if I don't have the capacity for it is essentially what that means. Mm-hmm. You've got that under there you are going to constantly subtly sabotage every one of your strategies that you're implementing because you don't want it to work out fully because part of you thinks you can't handle it if it does. Oh, God. Which is why why you have the people who spend six months and you're like, just launch the thing already. (laughs) because, Because it's not that they don't have this amazing system and strategy that you've taught them. It's incredible. It's deeper than that. It's what if I launch the blog and I get everything I want, then what, who, Mm. I don't know who that version of me is. What if I can't handle it? What if, you know, there's all these fears that come up. So that's why capacity is important. Oh my gosh. I mean, I feel like I've got chills. I've got like so many follow-up questions. It's reminding me, I just finished reading the book that Amanda Francis wrote called Rich as Fuck. I don't know if you've read it, but yeah. horrible title, but it's actually a very good book that you would not guess from yeah, the title. title. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all about um, apologetic Yeah. Book. Talk. <laughs> well, she, she definitely is that, but she talks about these set points as well. And it was the first time that I thought about it. And it was funny because right after, so I had lunch with a friend and she was telling me like, yeah, you know how like you'll get like a $2,000 bonus or something like that. And then like the next day your car breaks down and like, then it just in and out. And then I was like, yeah, that is weird how that happens. And then like the next day I read Amanda's book, she talks about these set points and I was like, Oh, that's why it was like, you didn't know how, like you weren't ready to receive that money and know how to just hold on to it and manage yes. it. Yes. Yeah. I used to do a, I used to do like a virtual day long retreat for money capacity. And I would do an exercise where I would send in halfway through the retreat as we were, it was like a four hour retreat. I would send them a bank balance that had been customized for each one of them. Cause I kind of knew like the money set points of everybody on the call. Mm-hmm. And I would send like somebody like, here's your bank balance, $750,000. And I'd be like, what? And just to see the variety of responses that people would put in the chat during that retreat, they'd be mm-hmm. like, 
I am like sweating, like Like, I almost, I just associated, I can't believe it. You know, like this is not my bank account. I'm finding excuses for why this isn't my Mm -hmm. bank account. It was fascinating to watch the reactions. And I think that is so fascinating. And I I can see this showing up in my own life in in a slightly different way, but I think it goes back to the same capacity set points of, there was a time when I first started my business and I thought like, if I could just make $5,000 a month, oh my God, that (laughs) would be like the best thing ever. And then you get there and then I go, well, what if it could be $10,000 a month? And then I like get to 10,000 and you, I can maintain that 10,000 before I like mentally then say, how about 25? And like, and each time I'm able to, to meet the goal. And yeah, part of it is maybe that I had a new strategy or I learned a new, you know, practice or something. But I think so much of it is just mentally being like, okay, I'm ready for that next level. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm the same way. Like I'm very, I lean expansively towards money in that way, but I will tell you, eventually we always hit plateaus. Always, Mm -hmm. always, always. And then that is when the deepest money capacity stuff comes out. Like I had a client who just kept doubling and doubling. And then all of a sudden she got to a certain amount. And then it was like two years where she's like, what is going on? Like we can't, she was so used to expanding Mm -hmm. every month, you know, like doubling it. She's like, I can't figure out. We've been like this for two years. What's going on? We ended up uncovering this memory that she had from when she was maybe like 12. And in her home, her mother had started to out earn her dad. And the dad, when the mother reached a certain, I think, I I forget what the amount was, but it was close to the amount she couldn't get past. Mm. The dad left the family because he was so threatened by the mom earning more than him. Wow. So she had this like super subconscious thing that like, if I earn more than this, bad things happen. Right. And when we were able to expand her capacity in that area a little bit, she started moving past that plateau again. So I would say like to everybody, I don't, I mean, I've worked, I have clients who are eight figure business owners. I've worked with all sorts of, I've worked, I've worked with Oscar nominees, Nobel Peace Prize nominees. I've worked with, you know, moms, artists, all sorts of people from all sorts of careers and all sorts of incomes. And no matter what, there's always a point where you hit some sort of plateau. And I don't mean that to scare anybody. I say it so that you prepare yourself because it's a good thing because Mm -hmm. that plateau that you hit, if you are willing to work on your capacity when you hit it and look more deeply at why you're hitting that plateau, you'll, you'll be prepared for it, number one. And number two, once you work through that and you expand your capacity at that set point that you have, all of a sudden your, your ability to earn more just take, goes by leaps and bounds because mm. that set point, that plateau is what was holding you back from that next level. Right. Okay. So you've mentioned there's six types of capacities. Can you tell us about a little bit about each one? Yeah. So the first one is money capacity, which we've talked about a lot. (laughs) And that that's your ability to earn, save, and invest larger and larger amounts of money every year. Um, Visibility capacity, which is also one of the most popular ones. And the example you were telling me about, oh, like just do it already. Like Mm -hmm. that immediate, I'm like visibility capacity, visibility (laughs) capacity. So your visibility capacity is your ability to allow all of you to be fully seen. So a lot of people hide. They're afraid of more visibility, even though they say they want more of it. Um, I'll tell a brief, quick story about how that looks. I had a client who had a very successful $500,000 revenue business and plateau. And it came out through our work together that she actually had this whole intuitive side that she would use in her private coaching, but she never talked about it in her like, you know, more mainstream, like larger group programs. And she had this event that she would really work hard to fill to like 80 something people every year. She was afraid of showing that part of her because she didn't want to be judged. We worked on that and she decided like, I want to incorporate this into my brand because it's a huge part of me. That year when she kind of came out as an intuitive and that she would be weaving it into her business coaching, she went like her event, I think sold like over two, it was like over 240 people signed up for it. 
So it like more than doubled the mm -hmm. attendance for that event. So that's the power of we hold these things back and we're afraid that we'll get judged. And sometimes they're the most lucrative aspect that yeah. we can with people. That um, just reminds me last year, I um, was working with a coach and after she got to know me, you know, this was almost a year into our relationship. She's like, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but your emails that like I send to my list, your emails are nicer than you are. And <laughs> I was like, huh? Well, it's interesting. Cause, um, my copywriter writes my emails. I don't write them. And she's like, yeah, I can tell because now that I know you, they don't feel like you. And she's like, I'm not saying you're like a bitch. It's more just that she's like, you've got this boldness, like this edginess to you. And I don't see that in your emails. They're very like sweet and not that you're not a nice person. And so I sat with that for a while and I realized that when for my whole life, I've been quote unquote, opinionated. And people have always told me, wow, you have a lot of opinions or you're a strong personality. And what I've internalized that to mean is like, you're too much, right? Yeah. Like you need to tone it down. You're difficult. And yeah. so I wasn't showing up as my full self because I didn't want people to think I was difficult. Yes. And as soon as I realized that, and then was like, well, screw it. I, I'm not difficult. I just have thoughts and opinions and you know, that's allowed and I'm just going to share them. And if you don't like them, then you can leave. And if you do, then you can stay and great. Yeah. And I feel like my business has had exponential growth since then. And since I started saying, okay, I'm going to write my own emails now. And I went back and I redid all of the emails, like in our welcome series and some of our evergreen funnels and now I'm showing up so much more as like, no, this is me and I curse and I am not always like sweet and innocent and nurturing and like, I'm the tough love kind of coach. And I feel like, yeah, it's now magnetizing the right people. That's what I was going to ask you is like, have you noticed that it has changed who comes your way and that the people who come your way are more aligned? Yes. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Now don't get me wrong. I've gotten some people who love to let me know that they're unsubscribing and you know, that <laughs> bye. <laughs> okay, bye. There's a button for that. Bye. Um, but yeah. And there's been moments where it's been a little hard. Cause you're like, Oh shoot, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Maybe I should have held back a little bit. And then I just realized like, no, that's not what I want to do. If I can't be me in my own business, like what's the point? Yeah. Absolutely. Like a lot of times when people come to me and they're like, I just keep getting these terrible clients that are just so rude and like, or they're just like, blah, like, I don't want to be, you know, whatever. Like, it's not a fit. Mm -hmm. I'm like, um, it's not your, you know, funnel or your marketing. I mean, it is the marketing page. Cause if you're not showing up as yourself, it's not going to be in your marketing, but it's deeper than that. It's that it's that you are just not being yourself. It's better mm -hmm. to like detox those people from the beginning. Right. Because then the people who don't get offended. But the worst is when like you come across as super sweet in an email and we're not getting your boldness and your edginess. And then you get on the phone with a client and you cuss and they're all offended. And now you right. can't even be yourself for the whole duration of that relationship, which sucks. Right. <laughs> like, exactly. You can't really coach them or help them at your best if you're like, you know, twisting yourself into a pretzel. So, so yeah, oh. so that's money and visibility and uh, purpose. We've talked about a little bit. I, I say that your inside is matching your outside. That's purpose capacity. And I've had a lot of people come to me telling me that some business coach told them they should start a business about this because it's more of a niche and it's more lucrative, but there's like literally no alignment with their purpose. Mm. And in some cases they've built these massively successful businesses and they're like, why am I always so tired and burned out? Why do I always feel so <laughs> resentful? I'm like, cause it's not your purpose. And so th eventually that business starts to plateau because you cannot sustain a business that's not in alignment with your purpose. Um, yes. Then we have embodiment, which I call your emotional, physical, and mental capacity. So that's like, are you, I used to have a friend who had embodiment capacity issues and she would leave me these messages when her launches were happening that literally sounded like she was having nervous breakdowns mm. every single time she launched and teams would quit on her and because of how stressed out she was. And that's an embodiment. It's like, you can't control your emotions. You can't 
anything that comes in from the outside, a tech meltdown in the middle of a webinar or whatever <laughs> is just like throwing you off so much or a hate comment or whatever throws you off so much that it just puts you into this chaos internally. Um, and then structural capacity, which is, I love talking about structural capacity. It's your foundations and structures that are holding you up to your next level. That's things like, do you have the right team? You want to go to eight figures? Do you have the team for eight figures? Cause you probably don't, you know, mm -hmm. like, do you need more help at home and you're just not getting it? Cause that's another team, your home team. Do you need to tell your kids to do their own damn laundry for one? <laughs> um, do you need to ask the cleaning lady to please stop putting things in different random areas and put them in the place they belong. So you don't spend an hour of your time looking for where the stuff is mm -hmm. or, you know, all those little things, they really add up to major energy leakage. If you are, don't have the right structures in place. And you know, I live right close to Oprah and I look at how she has her life structured and she has so much support and the right support. And she's able to do what she does because she has those structures in place and those people supporting her. Yeah. And then the final one is boundary capacity, which is a topic everybody loves to talk about. Um, and, but I, what I say that's different about this is that it's not just boundaries with other people. You know, it's not just saying no, or drawing the line with other people. It's boundaries with ourselves. Like where do we violate our own boundaries or gaslight our own boundaries? And are the boundaries that you have now the boundaries of the next level self? Like the boundaries I'm going to have at 5 million are very different than the boundaries I have at a million. Mm -hmm. And you have to start building the boundaries for 5 million now when you're at a million, for example, so that you actually have space to grow into the 5 million. Right. So those are the six capacities. Oh, so interesting. Um, the structural capacity reminds me too of, I remember listening to this interview um, with Rachel Rogers and her like best business advice was to hire support at home, like get a house manager, get a personal assistant. And this was maybe easier during, you know, pre COVID, but let's just pretend we're out of the pandemic and anybody can come into your house. It was like, it was so eye opening to me to think, Oh, so for my business to succeed, I need to stop taking so much mental bandwidth thinking about grocery shopping and meal prep and returning things at the at like Nordstrom or at you know going to the post office and um, organizing my pantry and doing the laundry and cleaning the house and like all these things that like we're not meant to do both at full capacity and it was, it seemed so counterintuitive. Like your best business advice is to hire a home, a house manager. But once I really understood the concept, it made so much sense. And I did it after, um, listening to that episode and it changed everything. And it was like, oh my gosh, I now have so much more space in my mind to actually think about how could I grow my business? How can I show up best in my business and things that I just didn't have the capacity for before. Absolutely. I have a cook. I have two personal assistants. I have a cleaning lady who comes twice a week. I have a gardener. Like that's just for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't even have kids yet. <laughs> like that's just for me. So I and mean, I think a lot of people are going to hear that and go like, oh my gosh, like that's, yeah. they're going to have some thought about it. Right. But if I'm, I'm saying that because I want them to apply it to themselves, why couldn't you have that? Exactly. exactly. I mean, I didn't start that way. I started with the cleaning lady. And then I was like, I'm getting to the point where I really need someone to return packages and do things for me that I don't have. I'd rather be working on a sales page than doing that. That's not my zone of genius, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then I have a cook because I, I like to eat very healthy. And I, I notice that if I'm very busy and I have a ton of calls one day, I'm much less likely to eat healthy if I don't have stuff already prepared because I don't have time to sit there and cook a whole healthy lunch with, mm -hmm. I'd rather be sitting in my garden for an hour with an already prepared meal. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I don't really, I find that whenever I get triggered by the amount of help people have, it's because it's because I'm not allowing myself that help. Right. So right. I always think triggers are, are, can be wonderful mirrors to see the ways that we're holding ourselves back. So I have literally no apologies. And I, and I speak about all the help I have because I want people to realize like, it's not like, you know, what you see on Instagram and Facebook and whatever, it's not 
just me being somehow good at all these amazing things and like right. doing it all by myself. Hell no, I've got a team of people in my business. Like don't buy into that illusion. Right. Exactly. I think there's so many people, you know, they'll say a self-made millionaire or, and like, yes, you may have, you know, (laughs) right. You may have created this business. It was your vision. Um, but yeah, nobody is, I mean, I think there are very few people, if any, that are running seven figure businesses as a one woman show. I would be shocked to to even find one person. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we might find them and they might be burned out and have horrible adrenal fatigue and like not <laughs> right. able to manage anything. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So I'm trying to figure out where to go from here because I would love to see if like we could pick maybe just a couple of the top capacities and talk about, okay, so I, I see what you're saying. How do I expand my capacity for these things? Yeah. Well, that's a huge question. And that's why I work with people over long periods of time, because it's really not something that we can resolve in like a two minute soundbite, right? But I can give you ideas for how to start. And one of the ways to start is to go back and listen to what I just, like I just described all the capacities and score yourself, like go from one to 10, one being lowest, 10 being highest. Because the first thing you need to understand is there's something called a capacity code and everybody has their own unique capacity code. And when you're able to score yourself on your capacities, then you at least know what you're working with. Mm -hmm. Then you at least know like like my top thing that I need to work on is this. And it's often not the thing you think is the problem. Mm -hmm. So I would go back and, you know, I would rewind and listen to kind of do like a self quiz and go from one to 10, how am I doing on my money capacity from one to 10? How am I doing on visibility and so on and so forth? Because then you'll have some scores in front of you and you'll realize like, Oh, like the highest score, which means it's the worst or the, the lowest score score is the worst one for me. And so let's say money capacity is your lowest score. Well, now, you know, actually the source of the problem is not what I thought was my visibility. It's money. Like money capacity is the source of my problem. And then you can ask yourself, well, what's one thing that I can start doing to work on expanding my money capacity? And it could be something like, you know, putting up my damn website for once once and for all so I can start collecting sales or Mm -hmm. reaching out to that person that I've been wanting to renew that I keep avoiding doing so, or Um, you know, like finally just launching the damn product that I've had just sitting there for three months and tinkering and tinkering and tinkering with it. Yeah. I think that the first step is just getting clear. Like my unique capacity code says that my money capacity is the most out of whack and I've got to work on that first. And one thing I talk about a lot is that the capacities are interwoven. So what you'll find is as you start working on the ones you have the most deficits in, you'll start to notice that the other ones kind of start to expand alongside it because, you know, like if I start taking care of my visibility capacity and I'm no longer afraid of being fully seen, now I'm making more money. So now Mm -hmm. my money capacity is expanding. And then that makes me be able to hire a more sophisticated team for my business. And so they're all really interwoven. I'm less afraid of setting boundaries because I'm not afraid of being seen as a person who respects herself and has good boundaries. So they're all really interwoven, but getting clear on where you have deficits is the most important thing. Now, I imagine though, so much of the deficits are like unconscious that you almost like need somebody to score this with you, either somebody that knows you or somebody that knows what questions to ask. Um, Because I imagine that like you could look, I'm sure, like I'm thinking of this one student in my course who's been launching for like two years and still hasn't done it. And I bet you if I I said, oh, I think, you know, your visibility capacity score is probably pretty low. She would be like, no, no, I don't think so. This is what I want. Yeah. Um, I think that the caveat is you have to be really honest with yourself as you Mm -hmm. score yourself number one. Number two, that's why I have like in my, I have a program called capacity shift. And in that program, when you join, you get something called a capacity quiz. And yes, that's why I have that quiz in there because it shows you without a doubt where you're lying to yourself because Mm -hmm. of how you answer the questions. Um, So yeah, you absolutely do need more support to figure out 
where you're lying to yourself and where you're not. But even if your responses are a lie to yourself, it doesn't matter really, because <laughs> if you start working on the one you think is the problem, the other one's going to come up too. So it doesn't really True. matter. True. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Now I have this question that you actually proposed, um, that we talk about, but I want to make sure I'm not overlapping. The question is like, we all know how we need to manage our time, but there are six sneaky ways successful women subconsciously drain their energy and power. Are these six, the six capacities? Yeah. Okay. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> okay. So, all right, we'll skip that. And, um, well not skip it. We already did it. So what are some going back then to this, like maybe there's some unconscious things that we are believing about ourselves or about our abilities. So what are some surprising signs that one might have say a scarcity mentality around money? Even maybe if you're a high earner or you think like, no, I, I want to be a seven figure business owner more than anything. Yeah. There are so many. I love talking about this because there are people who make lots of money who still have scarcity mindset. Um, so number one, you have a lot of people defaulting or not making payments or maybe not a ton, but more than you'd like. That is sort of a red flag that maybe there's something you need to look at within yourself that you're allowing that kind of energy into your space. Mm -hmm. Um, another one that's one of my favorites and it's super sneaky is that you feel like you need to get every last drop out of your investment. And what I mean, and that's not, a, it sounds bad when I say that, but I'll give you a perfect example. I have had some clients that are working with me one-on-one -on -one, and the way I structure my one-on-one -on -one is I just say it's up to two hours a month because a lot of the women who are working at me, with me at that level are very busy. And so they're actually really happy when we can solve the problem in less time mm -hmm. instead of just staying on the phone for an hour, just because our session is supposed to be an hour. If I can solve their pro a woman with abundance mentality, if I solve her problem in 20 to 25 minutes and we still have 40 minutes of the call left, she's like, Oh my God, thank you. Solved. I'm good. Like, I'll yeah, talk let's go. Right. Clients who have scarcity mentality, I, you, you'll feel it and be honest with yourself. If you do this, there's nothing wrong with it. I used to do this. Um, you're like, Oh, but we still have 40 minutes left. Let me just start trying to figure out every possible thing I could throw in there to get my full hour because I paid for this hour. That's scarcity mentality. So if you tend to do that, where you're just like, well, what about this? And what about that? you're still stuck in this um, mentality of like trading time for money. Mm -hmm. And that's not abundance mentality because for example, like you're not just for me, when I work with my clients, I'm not just like, Hey, I talked to you for an hour. You're out of my mind until we talk next. No, I'm like thinking about them. So I read something. It makes me think about something we need to talk about in our next session. So there's a considerable amount of energy going into my private clients and even in my clients in my group program. So you're not paying me for sessions. You're paying me to solve your problem, to help you solve your problem. And you're paying me to hold you in my energy field, in my mind, in my intention throughout the whole time we're working together. So Frankly, people who have abundance mindset, they appreciate their time and their energy being preserved. Mm -hmm. So that's something that is very sneaky that a lot of people do and they don't realize. Yeah, that um, just reminds me of something that came up for me recently that I was like, gosh, this is such a scarcity mindset, but I didn't realize it. And it, it, when you said hanging on to like every last drop of the investment or wanting to make sure you got your quote money's worth. Yes. So I hired two people in December and I ended up having to let them go at the end of the month for, we'll just leave it at that. And it was the $7,000 that I spent on these two people and I got nothing for it. And I could not get over it. Like, I just kept being like, this was such a waste. Maybe I should go back and even like request a refund or something because they didn't do what I hired them to do. Yeah. And finally, my integrator, my op ops person, she's like, Kate, this is just the cost of doing business. Like sometimes we just make investments and they don't work out and you just got to move on. And I realized like, gosh, I'm clinging so tightly to this money because I'm so afraid that like, there's not going to be more. And, oh, I just wasted $7,000. And what if I don't get that back? Yes. Oh, that's such a great example. Such a great example. And then this making me think of another thing. Um, 
and I have, a, I told you I have this program called Capacity Shift and it's like an ongoing group program because I've been working with enough people on their capacity for long enough that I know that it's really an individual process. And mm -hmm. for example, I have some people who join that program and they're on one capacity for six months mm. and it's designed that way so that it's not like the program begins here and by December, you now have capacity <laughs> right. you're done for life. You're good. Like, no nope, capacity is like till you die. Like you are working on your capacity till you die. And so I, it's a, it's really a rolling kind of a thing because I want people, if you're really checking in with yourself and you're really aligned with your process and you're allowing yourself the space to really expand your capacity on every level so that you can really go to the next level of your goals, you're not going to be thinking like, okay, my payments end in December. Like, you're not going to be thinking that you're literally thinking every month. Okay. Let me do an assessment. How am I doing? Nope. I've still got some work I've got to do on my visibility capacity. Let's do this. And I always notice that like some people, we tell people like, listen, please don't join if you can't commit to at least a year, because I don't want people coming in and out. It's very disruptive. Mm -hmm. And I'm very serious about the containers of the programs that I create. And I can always tell the people who are really in it to work on their capacity and the ones who are like, have just been waiting for the year to be up. And instead of actually going in and assessing, like, I'm not ready, you know, like I still need some work I have to do. They're like, okay, thanks. I, uh, my, my 12 months are up. So I'm, uh, thank you so much for everything. Bye. And I'm like, you are just thinking about the money and the payments and you, it proves to me that you actually didn't work on your capacity the entire time mm -hmm. that we were working together. So that's another kind of a sneaky where you're just like focused on the wrong thing instead of focusing on your process. Right. Um, gosh, right. I could talk about this topic forever. There's so many. <laughs> so there are, there are, I'm trying to think of, um, I mean, I think I've heard what you mentioned this before and I've heard it before. And I, like I said, I've, I've struggled with building a team. I mean, it's definitely been one of the biggest challenges, probably the biggest challenge of my business. And I've heard things before, which are hard for me to hear because I'm like, oh shit, they're probably right. Where people say like, if you have a problem with team, you have a problem with yourself. And like, if look around, the common denominator is you and mm -hmm that's so hard to hear, but I'm like, okay, let's, let me just say, yeah, that's true. Now it's like, so what do I do about it? Well, you, first of all, again, you have to get clear. What is the thing that's causing the team problem? So like for me, the years I was having team issues, it was always me. And it wasn't that I was an asshole or a bad boss. It was that I didn't believe, like I was raised by a narcissistic parent and so I was used to, my nervous system became calibrated to a certain level of treatment and a certain level of gaslighting. And that's what relationships were like for me growing up as a kid. And so I never, that's what my nervous system knows, even though it's not good for my nervous system, it feels comforting to my nervous system because it's what it knows. Mm -hmm. And I had to do, do a lot of work gosh, like five years of, I, I, I still go to therapy every week and I will never not have a therapist on the payroll because mm -hmm. your business brings up all your stuff, just like relationships bring up all your stuff. And I realized that I was attracting team members that were like that parent that were either um, gaslighting me or telling me that um, I had one person who came in and was like, everything's a mess. I'm going to need to clean all of this up for you. And I was like, oh my God, like I didn't realize things were that messy. And <laughs> gas lit me for months and months and months. And then like was never happy and was always complaining about how I'm this and I'm that. And I was like, oh my God, like I must be the worst person ever. <laughs> but I'm very lucky that I have mentors who I trust so much because I've been working with them for a long time. And they're the kind of people who will tell me like, you are wrong. You need to sit your butt down and shut up. Mm -hmm. and I, I love hiring mentors like that. And my mentor said to me, you're not wrong. This person is really shitty at their job. And what they're doing is they're gaslighting you and trying to act like you are the problem to cover up for the fact that they're not good at their job. Mm. And when she said that to me, I was like, Oh my God, that is my freaking parent from when I was a kid. And here it is. So I really had to work intensively on how my, like recalibrating my nervous system, essentially mm -hmm. to 
notice and reject that kind of dynamic. And when I did that, I had team members come in that were so good at what they did and so supportive. And like, I remember one of them said to me, I am so mad that you have been so under supported for so long. Mm. And I was like, what are you saying? (laughs) I was like, wait. And I almost, I remember feeling my capacity edge when that happened. I was almost like, I feel uncomfortable right now that this person is so on my side. Like I'm not used to this. And I had to work on my capacity to be able to receive that level of support where he was like, nope, you're right. And that, nope, that person's wrong. No, I fully support you. I was like, I don't know this. What is this? (laughs) I'm not used to this. I feel very uncomfortable right now. Like, can I trust this? And I could, but that, you know, that's why it is you. It's absolutely always you. And I would attract for a long time clients that were the, my narcissistic parent Mm -hmm. and it would always end up being a bad experience or something would blow up. So it is always you. I mean, let's, let me just be clear about that. I, I'm not a fan of using that as a form of spiritual bypassing and gaslighting people out of their experience. That's not how I mean it, but I do always question. Mm -hmm. I like to ask myself the question, could this be me? Mm -hmm. And in my experience, a lot of times it is. Yeah. Um, It doesn't mean it's your fault. You know, it's not your fault. If you had bad, this wasn't my fault that I had a narcissistic parent, but it is my responsibility as an adult to undo those patterns and not pass them on to other people. Right. Yeah. Well, and what's coming up for me too, is that I think women in particular have a very difficult time receiving support because we are supposed to be like super women and we're supposed to do it all. And that's like the dream of how do you do it all? And you make it look easy. And so it feels so uncomfortable when people are like, let me do this for you and let me help you. Let me support you. I think there's a lot of like just unlearning from cultural norms and like societal expectations that we have to do to just be willing to receive support without guilt, without thinking that we're doing it because we couldn't do it by ourselves. And that means something bad about us. Or someone's going to hold something against us later on Mm. because they gave us help. Right. Right. That's a, that's a thing. Like if we've had experiences in the past where family members or whatever, were like, well, I did this for you. Now you have to do. And it was like, wait, I didn't agree to that. Then we can also have those fears of receiving help. Cause we're like, what, what are the strings attached to this help right now? Right. Right. Exactly. Well, and I think just to wrap things up, it is so important to note what you said earlier, which is that this is not a one and done kind of thing. This is stuff that is a lifetime and you may even like expand your capacity. And then a few years later, something else happens. And like the same shit comes up for us all over and over and over again. So I'm sure there are still even times in your life now where you deal with the narcissistic thing coming up again. And you're like, well, I thought we were past this, but here I am doing it again. Yes. What I will say is I've been working on it for over 10 years now. So it happens less and less every year and you notice it quicker. So you can interrupt the pattern more quickly. Right. Right. Um, And I've gotten to the point where I really just get very, I maybe get like one person that's like that. And I usually notice it pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, last year I did, I did attract somebody like that every year. It's less and less, but last year I did attract one person like that. And thankfully I noticed it in time and kicked them out of my sphere. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, when you do that, they have this massive reaction and, you know, cause they don't like to be set boundaries on, but, um, but yeah, no, I, it doesn't matter what level you're at. Like I said, I have been uh, advising on boards of hundred million dollar companies. I have, I have several clients who are in eight figures right now. I have clients who are at 50,000. Like it doesn't matter. You are every time you hit another level, you know, if you're used to making 200,000 a year, and then you go to a million in the, the span of a year or two, the challenges of a million dollar business are very different than the challenges of a $200,000 business. Mm -hmm. And you haven't built the capacity. I mean, you have, if you've been working on your capacity, you have, most people aren't, most people are just focusing on their strategies. So now you have to learn how to deal with what are the types of team issues that happen when you're at a million dollars? What are the type of marketing issues that happen when you're at a million dollars? Customer service issues. 
Yeah. Right, exactly. Delivery of your service, like all of that. And so, you know, capacity is an endless thing. And I think as much as we prioritize investing in like the expertise of strategists, we have to prioritize on an equal level the expertise of people who can help us work on our capacity. Because if you have strategy, but you don't have capacity, your strategy doesn't work or you don't implement it, period. Mm -hmm. If you have capacity to implement the strategy, capacity to deal with whatever, all strategies have hiccups because not no strategy is one size fits all. And right. your business is different than mine. We might apply the same strategy and we get different results because we have different audiences. So we have to customize all those things require capacity, all mm -hmm. of those things. So mm -hmm. it's like, trying to, I tell my clients, like trying to do, trying to do success without capacity is like trying to drive a Ferrari down the highway with zero gas or with like unleaded crappy gas that doesn't actually support the functioning of the motor mm -hmm. of the car. You're not going to get very far or you won't get anywhere at all. Right. Great analogy. I love that. Okay. So we're coming up on the end here, Lisa, tell everybody before we have a quick lightning round of questions that we do, but before we get there, tell everybody where they can find you. I'm Lisa Fabrega across all platforms. So you can find me at my website, lisafabrega.com. I have a really awesome little free thing where you can download a video and it will ask you three really good journaling questions to get a sense of what's going on with your capacity. Um, and then I'm, I'm very active on Instagram. I'm at Lisa Fabrega there and on Facebook and LinkedIn. I'm at Lisa Fabrega. Okay. Awesome. Thank you yeah. so much. Okay. So quick lightning round, just first thing that comes to your mind. What is your favorite way to make time for self-care? Um, going for really long, like two hour walks. Mm, so good. Yeah. One tool or strategy that you use to help with time management. Pomodoro technique. That's a good one. I, I feel like I always, like I have the um, Chrome extension on my computer and for like a week, I'll remember to do it. And then I forget. <laughs> good reminder. I got to do that. I'm not perfect at it, but it does work. <laughs> yes. It is super helpful. Um, what I've been doing too, when I've been good at it is when I get the ding that goes like, okay, take a break, stand up. I do 25 jumping jacks just to like nice. get my blood pumping and move yeah. a little bit. Cause I'm just sitting right all day in front of this desk. And so yeah. it's like, it doesn't require me to do a full blown workout or like go for a long walk. If I don't have the time, it's just like, just move your body real quick. Yeah. I love that. Um, okay. What is one of the most powerful or maybe the most recent business mindset or entrepreneurial book you've read? Oh gosh. I really don't read entrepreneurial books. Um, there was mindset, one, any good mindset books? I don't really read mindset books either. But I, <laughs> I did read a business book. Um, gosh, I can't remember the name of it. Hold on. I can tell you, I can look it up right now. It was about managing teams and it was very good. And I found out they like, it was even mentioned on Silicon Valley, which I used to love that show. Before My husband loves that show. <laughs> um, oh shoot, hold on. What was the name of this book? It was the one about, um, it's a very famous leadership book. It's in my Kindle somewhere. <laughs> something like radical leadership or something like that. And it's just about being really blunt and- Radical candor? That's it. Radical candor. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I, I read that book too. I really liked it as well. Yeah. That's I'm a very direct was. person. So I was like feeling very vindicated reading the book. <laughs> yeah. Challenge directly care personally. Right. That's yeah. like the definition of, I loved that. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you have a quote or mantra or an affirmation or anything you're telling yourself now? Um, yes, there's a beautiful mantra that I learned, um, from her name is Dr. Cleopatra and I'm going to butcher it, but it goes something like, um, I am the light of my soul. I am beautiful. I am bountiful. I am bliss. And I just, mm. when I go on my long walks, I just say that to myself out loud over and over and over again. And it makes you feel really good. It's actually a mantra to shift energy in your body. Is Dr. Cleopatra, the fertility expert. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. I love her. She's a good I friend of mine. Yeah. yeah. I'm in a like little mastermind chat with her. So, okay. I was too last year and she actually is the fertility expert on my wellness blog, Root and Revel. So she's done a bunch of stuff. Yeah. When you said, I know Dr. Cleopatra, I mean, it's a pretty unique name in the first place, but her last name, right. I, I have no idea. <laughs> Bean, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
What does success with soul mean to you? I think it means building, um, what you want to build with alignment to it. Um, and I actually teach a process called soul whispering in the capacity work. And so it's actually taking a moment and using your soul as the guide and the GPS of your life and, and the things that you do in your work too, because I think mm-hmm. that when you use your soul as the GPS, you, you never go wrong. It's really our egos that doubt the instructions of the GPS that screw it all up. Love that so much. Thanks, Lisa. This was so fun. You're welcome. Thank you.